All right. All right, we are live. So Karen, are you still there? Sure am. Awesome, sounds good. So we'll get started uh, just a few minutes past seven here. So welcome everybody and good evening. I hope um, everybody's having a great, great day. We are in the middle of our 4-H achievement day season. So we're, this year that looks more just like 4-H sales. So we know this year looks a little different. And we know also this year that buyers are a little bit different than normal. So hopefully this webinar will help everybody with their buyers, um, informing them and engaging them and helping them with their end product. So with that, my name is Lexi Hoy. I am a 4-H specialist with 4-H Alberta. Mm -hmm. And tonight I am pleased to be joined by Karen Schmid of Alberta Beef Producers and Matthew Prey of Canada Beef. So a brief overview of this evening. We will have presentations by both Karen and Matthew. And then we will ask you to type in your questions whenever you have them. Uh, and that can be found at the bottom of your screen where there is a Q and A box. If you just move your mouse um, over your screen, you should have a bar pop up across the bottom with Q and A. You can answer your questions or ask your questions in there and we'll get to them at the end. If you have any issues uh, throughout the webinar or um, questions just for myself that you'd like to ask me, um, please feel free to use the uh, the chat function or throughout the webinar, feel free to use the chat function there as well. I will be getting to those in just a minute. I can see a few raised hands. I'll get to you um, once we get started. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce both Karen and Matthew, and then we will have uh, Karen speak followed by Matthew. So I'm looking forward to this evening and I hope the rest of you are as well. So Karen grew up on a mixed farm near Kilma, Alberta. She raised Simmental, purebred Simmental cattle and grain and is still involved in the family operation to a limited extent. She has a master's degree in agriculture from the University of Alberta and her thesis focused on the genetic and metabolic factors affecting feed efficiency in cattle. Before joining Alberta Beef Producers, Karen spent just over four years with the Canadian Hereford Association as their breed development coordinator. At ABP, Karen is the research and production manager, providing technical support in the areas of cattle health and welfare, research and production practices. She works very closely with a number of industry and government organizations on the issues of importance to the industry. And a large part of her job is translating science to producers and explaining producer needs to researchers. So welcome, Karen. And Matthew. Matthew Prey is the executive director of the Canadian Beef Center of Excellence. For more than 20 years, Matthew Prey has worked in the hospitality industry in product development promotion and sales in both domestic and international markets. As a Red Seal certified chef, Matthew's dedication and passion for providing engaging and uniquely Canadian hospitality experiences have provided the opportunity to travel across Canada and around the world to share Canada's rich culinary heritage expressed through the premium quality Canadian ingredients. Before joining the Canadian Beef Center of Excellence, Perret worked in some of Canada's best kitchens mentored by top chefs, including time spent as senior chef on the Royal Canadian Pacific Railways. Perret joined Canada Beef in 2017 as executive director for the Canadian Beef Centre of Excellence. In this leadership role, Matthew acts as an ambassador for Canadian beef and veal in domestic and foreign markets, oversees the CBCE's culinary and butchery talent, and manages its facility and activities. He was also responsible for the development of emerging markets from 2017 to 2020. In this time, the CBCE, pardon me, in his time at the CBCE, Perry designed and hosted more than 20 incoming international buyers missions, over 60 domestic product development and engagements, and delivered Canadian beef and veal technical training in 10 countries. Perry graduated with honors from the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology and Culinary Arts, earning the Governor General of Canada's Medal for Academic Achievement. Prior to that, he studied tourism, marketing, and business management at Capilano University, North Vancouver, BC. He is fluent in three languages, English, French, and Spanish. Perry lives in Calgary with his wife, Dorothy, and a retriever named Coco. So with that, welcome everybody. Welcome Matthew, welcome Karen. And Karen, we will have you share your screen and get us started. Perfect, thanks Lexi. I'll just get my screen shared here. And while I'm doing that, I'd like to thank 4-H Alberta for 
having me tonight. It's a, an honor as a past 4-H kid to, to talk to the up and comers. So that's pretty great. Um, so the focus of my presentation is really, once it becomes full screen here, uh, really about those answers to common questions. And we know right now that you're having some conversations with probably some customers and some consumers that you might not have had conversations with before. And they might have questions about all sorts of production practices like growth promotants, antibiotics, environmental impact, nutrition of the cattle, not necessarily the beef because they're looking to buy beef, um, and maybe even COVID-19. And I think it's really important when we're engaging with, with this audience that we don't normally talk to that we think about how we do that as well, because honestly, they don't know what they don't know. They're curious, they've been bombarded by media, by Netflix documentaries, all telling them terrible things about cattle. And they probably just have some questions. And the best way to kind of dig into why they might have concerns or worries about some of these production practices is to ask them why, and maybe find out why that particular concern is important to them. And after you found that out, you can engage with them on a bit different level and then provide them some of the very cool facts I'm gonna share. So we'll start off with why we use hormones and beta agonists. And we all know that it shifts growth towards muscle production, but again, the consumers don't know what they don't know. This gives us a 10 to 20% improvement in average daily gain or feed efficiency, which then translates into a five to 10% decrease in production costs. So there's a very valid economic reason why we do these things. Beta agonists like Optiflex, which would be the brand name you're familiar with, are fed really short duration at the end of the feeding period and provide a 15 to 25% boost in average daily gain. And an interesting fact about these beta agonists is that they were first developed as asthma medicine for people, but they didn't really work very well. And then they found out that they had these, these growth impacts for cattle. So this is why we think they're important um, reducing our production costs, improving our efficiency. Um, but there are some other side benefits of why we use them as well. And to put that in context, it's about producing more beef with less inputs. So we're producing 29%, we're producing the same amount of beef with 29% fewer cattle, 24% less land, and 14% less greenhouse gases. And if we were to return to the time of the 1950s when we didn't use any of these technologies, we'd need more feed, more water, more fuel, and beat the price of beef would go up. So this is a bit of context about why we use the technologies we use. In addition, most people are a bit concerned about what it might be doing within their bodies when they eat hormones. Um, in the diet, meat and fish really only provide 5% of the progesterone, 20 to 30% of the testosterone, and 15 to 20% of the estrogens. The rest is coming from other foods, and you don't have to pay any, any attention to the numbers in the chart there, but it, it's really saying is that hormones are in everything we eat, and we need to put them into context. In addition, they have a really, really low bioavailability, which means when you put them in your mouth and eat them orally, only five to 10% of the active compound actually does anything in your body. The rest just get, passes right through and gets excreted. So when we look at the hormone content of number of various different foods, we're seeing that the difference of a serving of beef of an implanted animal compared to a serving of beef from an animal that wasn't implanted is a very, very small number. We're talking about 1.9 nanograms compared to 1.1 nanograms. And a nanogram is a billionth of a gram. They're all really, really small numbers. So the best way I've heard it explained as a comparison is the difference between a, some beef from an implanted animal and some beef with, from an animal that wasn't implanted is about a blade of grass in a football field. So we're putting this into context for people. If I wanted to match my own production of estrogen every day, I'd have to eat 95 cows, full cows. That is too many cows. No one can eat that many cows. 
And even the segments of the population that may be most sensitive to hormone fluctuations, um, boys and girls before they hit puberty, we're looking at eight and 10 cows a day. And I guarantee you, your kids can't eat that many cows. So that's how we can put some of these things into context for people. Because, you know, if we're talking about 28,000 nanograms, it might sound pretty scary until you realize that a nanogram is such a small number that the biological relevance is, is almost gone. Moving on, antibiotics. Just like kids get sick and we need to treat them, we need to treat animals as well. And most people I find don't have any problem with this, this usage of antibiotics. They want us to treat sick animals and they want them to get better. So A, they're not eating meat from anything that was sick and, and B, we're taking care of our animals like we're supposed to be doing all the time. But they have a little bit more of an issue with prevention. And, and where we run into, run into some issues is if we're, we have to mass treat a group of cattle to prevent the infections in the cattle that aren't sick yet, but we are pretty sure they're going to get sick. And what this can actually do is re reduce the need for more powerful antibiotics later on. And this isn't unique to agriculture. This happens in human medicine as well. I had knee surgery a few years ago, and the first thing they did was pump me full of IV antibiotics so that I didn't get an infection that they would have to treat later. So if you can put some things like that into context into uh, situations with human medicine, it, it may help uh, put it all into context for, for these buyers. Now, the biggest thing that they don't like is using antibiotics for growth promotion. And as of December in 2018, there are no antibiotic products that are approved that have a label claim for growth promotion. So using antibiotics for growth promotion is not a thing in the cattle industry and it's not something that we can legally do. So that helps us. Ionophores are technically antibiotics. So these are things like rumensin and Bovatec, but they're not used in human medicine and they have a different mode of action than the antibiotics we're familiar with. Um, and there's no evidence that they cause any co or cross resistance with the, the antibiotics that are important in human medicine. There's also oversight. So just like when we need a prescription, when we're sick, we now, all medically important antibiotics require a veterinary prescription. So that's another way you can say, look, just like I can't get a bunch of antibiotics over the counter unless I have a prescription from my doctor, it's the same in cattle. There's also a withdrawal period. And the withdrawal period is the amount of time between uh, when an antibiotic is administered and when the animal can be sent to slaughter. And this is put in place so that all traces of the antibiotics are gone from the animal system and we're not eating a bunch of antibiotic residues. There's also residue testing that happens and no foods that test positive for residues are allowed in the food chain. Now residues are a different issue that often get confused with antibiotic resistance. But if we're putting antibiotic resistance into context, this is this chain of events that all has to happen um, for someone to get an antibiotic resistant drug, re an antibiotic resistant bacteria, sorry, uh, from an animal, and then it fails to respond to treatment. So first, you know, we have to treat a sick animal. The bacteria within that animal have to develop resistance. The bacteria has to survive multiple food safety controls at processing. So all of the things that happen at the packing plants, it has to survive all of that. It also has to survive cooking. That bacteria then has to make a person sick enough that they go to the doctor and the doctor prescribes them an antibiotic and then it fails to respond. So that's a pretty big chain of events. There's also difference in the antibiotics that are used in cattle and the antibiotics that, use, that are used in humans. And in Canada, we have a classification and it starts kind of like the drugs of very, very last resort in humans moves down a level, moves down a level. And then when you get to the low category, they're not used in human medicine. So 87% of the antibiotics that are used in people are of high and very high importance. So those drugs of last resort, if they don't work, nothing else will. 
but 71% of the antibiotics used in livestock and pets are either not used in human medicine or the step just above that. So there's lots of other drugs that can be used uh, if the bacteria happen to be resistant to that. Now there is some crossover between families and we're constantly working on surveillance and monitoring and finding ways to reduce our antibiotic usage. And these are all things that you could tell consumers to make them feel better about what we're doing on the farm. In addition to that, um, resistance to E. coli in retail beef, so this is the beef at the stores, to any of the drugs in the very high importance category, so those are the drugs of very, very last resort in human medicine, is less than two and a half percent. So we have a pretty good story to tell when it comes to antibiotics and beef production. Maybe even more interestingly, as bacteria move through the environment, the species composition changes. And you don't really need to worry about all the Latin names on the side, but what this chart is showing is that when we start off looking at fecal samples right here with this big green bar, there's one species of gut bacteria that, that is very predominant. As we move through manure, the catch basin, to surface water, to the processing plant, we can see that the species composition changes and we're starting to see more blue. And by the time we get to people that are sick with this particular type of bacteria, there's no green left. So the bacteria that, were, that are most common in cattle production actually aren't causing illness in humans when, it, when we're talking about this specific type of, of bacteria. So the other piece is environmental impact. It's received a lot of media attention. There's been a lot of documentaries produced, um, a lot of of hype and, and misinformation, I would say. And, and really, they all tend to use the global numbers. And it's important to remember that Canada is a developed country. And in developed countries, the greenhouse gases from agriculture are a much smaller proportion of the total emissions. And this is because of all those efficiencies, you know, due to things like growth hormones um, that help us be more efficient. So in Canada, our beef production accounts for only 0.04% of our global greenhouse gas emissions. And in Canada, our biggest contributors are energy for transport and energy for combustion. In beef cattle, we're looking at 2.4% of Canada's total greenhouse gas emissions. And I think this is important. And while this is a small number, that doesn't mean we're not trying to make it even better. Um, but we also have to remember all of the other side benefits that cattle provide in terms of environmental impact. It's not all about greenhouse gases. One of the big things that we, we hear a lot of is that we could stop feeding cattle and we could use all of that land to grow crops for people. But almost a third of Canada's agricultural land can't be used to grow crops. It's too rocky, it's too salty, it's too hilly, it's too steep, it's too dry. But cattle can still graze them. And less than 9% of the cropland in Canada is actually used to grow feed for cattle. So if we took just that 9% and shifted it into food production for humans, I don't think that's going to make up the difference if everyone was, was vegetarian. We've also got some other, in, other big environmental benefits. There's biodiversity, those grasslands provide habitat for wildlife. It's a big part of the carbon cycle. Um, you know, and this carbon actually that's part of this, this biogenic carbon cycle is recycled. So it's not like cattle are suddenly putting way more carbon into the atmosphere because it's used by plants to grow and it's recycled through cattle. And grasslands around the world store nearly 30% of global soil carbon. So these are pretty important ecosystems to, to keep uh, around and, and to have for, for those other benefits that, that maybe aren't as easy to quantify as the megatons of greenhouse gas emitted every year. And we're doing a pretty good job. Over the last 30 years, producing the same amount of beef. We've reduced our methane by 14%, our nitrous oxide by 15%, and our CO2 by 12%. And we're all doing it with fewer cattle and less land. So 
we're trying to we're trying to continuously improve this and and initiatives like the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef are trying to set way more um, ambitious goals than that even right now. So we're we're not just riding on our laurels, right? This is this is something we take seriously and something that that we don't think uh, gets enough attention. So what about grain fed versus grass fed? And I don't think there's a, a ton of you 4-H kids that are that are trying to do grass fed beef given the way the cycle of the 4-H program works, but you know, we can tell them that all cattle are on pasture and forage based diets for most of their life. Over the whole production system, including feedlots, 80% of an animal's diet, a cattle diet is made up of forages. And welfare, it doesn't matter if it's grain fed or grass fed, it's paramount in all operations. And we have programs like the Code of Practice and Verified Beef Production Plus that ensure that producers know these best management practices, regardless of whether it's a, it's a more extensive grass-based system or whether it's a more intensive feedlot-based system. If we're not taking care of the cattle, they don't produce. And it doesn't make any sense to make less money by treating them poorly, right? Like if you just sit back and think about it for a second, you can see the light bulb go off in their eyes. But with, with grass fed, there is a bit of a trade off in environmental impact. And in my personal opinion, a bit of a trade off in taste. I'm not a huge fan of, of grass fed meat, but that's personal preference. Um, but with environmental impact, the longer the cattle take to get to finish weight and take to get to slaughter, the more greenhouse gases they're producing. And actually, if we look at our mature cow herd and um, they produce 80% of the greenhouse gases, the feedlot systems only actually accounts for 20%, which is something that, that I, even I find misconceptions about in, in our own industry. So what about the actual nutrition? So here we've got protein, zinc, and iron, grain fed and grass fed, and they're, they're basically identical. But that's not where we hear why grass fed might be superior. It's all about the fatty acids. And really what they're thinking about there is omega-3 fatty acids. And sure, if you look at the green box, which is still grass fed, there is a bit more omega-3 fatty acids in grass fed beef. But quite honestly, if you want to get your omega-3s, you got to go eat some fish because we don't have it in beef. It's in such a small proportion that it's not going to do anything for anyone's health. So COVID, well, it's made life very crazy. Um, I think it's important that some of the some of your consumers may hear that there is a bovine coronavirus that causes scours. This is not the same thing. It is a completely different virus. There is no evidence of any livestock anywhere in the world uh, being naturally infected to date. They have tried to do some experiments with pigs, chickens, and ducks and haven't been able to infect them experimentally. Uh, research is ongoing in other livestock species, including cattle, so we'll stay tuned for those results. But right now, I, I think it's, it's looking fairly promising um, that it shouldn't be a, a livestock, there shouldn't be a livestock reservoir. But some other animals can get COVID. So cats, ferrets, hamsters, mink, and dogs can all get it. Um, dogs don't seem to show any signs of illness and it doesn't seem to be deadly to any of these animals at this stage, but we'll stay tuned on that as well. But I think more importantly is there's no evidence of transmission back to people. So there's no evidence that an animal gets it from a person and then can spread it back to, from the animal back to the person again, right? So it really is a person to person disease at this stage and, and hopefully it stays that way. But, but what about the meat? So it can survive on surfaces, um, especially smooth surfaces. It lasts for about three days at room temperature for plastic, but it needs a live host to replicate. So while it's on these surfaces, the number of virus particles that are actually there are just going down and what they don't know at this stage is at those three days when they can still detect it on plastic is if it's actually at a dose high enough to be infectious. Um, right now, again, there's no evidence to support transmission through products or packaging. And I think 
with the amount of goods and people doing uh, lots of grocery side pickups and getting groceries through the mail and curbside, if it was a if it was a big component of community transfer, I think we'd be seeing it by now. Um, and again, just being careful about your hygiene is going to reduce your risk as, as practically as low as it can go. So wash your hands, avoid cross contamination with other products and raw products, cook food to proper internal temperatures, just standard stuff, I mean, just be smart about it. And, and I don't even think if it was there that if you followed those standard hygiene practices that you'd pick it up. So that's about it for me at this stage. I'll take this opportunity before I hand it over to Matthew to uh, remind you if you have questions to type them into that Q&A box and we'll get to them after Matthew's done. Thanks. I'll stop sharing. I think, yep. Awesome, thank you, Karen. Um, Matthew, did you want to share your screen and we'll get started on your presentation? So yeah, just as Karen said, while we're waiting for um, Matthew, just, oh, that was fast. Wow, good job. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, put them in the Q&A. And if you're watching on our Facebook live stream, feel free to put them under the live stream. I will be checking those comments as well. So with that, um, Matthew, take it away. Thanks very much, Alexia. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and um, and also to welcome you into my home. I haven't had many visitors over the past uh, few weeks. And so um, so welcome everybody. Uh, the presentation this evening, it's gonna be a, a relatively quick one and I wanted to uh, keep it quite focused, as focused as possible. And uh, so what we're gonna look at are some of the uh, really key considerations for your market, the folks that are buying uh, the, the, the premium quality Canadian beef or beef raised here in Alberta that you have, um, that you're providing to them. And, uh, and I guess it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty significant in terms of uh, the quality of the product itself and, uh, and that you have uh, a pride in it, of course, but an ability to express that quality. And I would say a lot of what Canada Beef can offer you in terms of resources is to help put into to words, to marketing words, about, uh, about what that consumer's experience is gonna be uh, in their enjoyment of their steaks, their roasts, or their ground beef products. And so I've, I've tried to break it uh, down into three basic uh, areas. And so we're gonna, we're gonna start off by looking at the carcass and we are going to uh, look at a few different areas, the, the primal cuts from the carcass, talk about some of the attributes of those different uh, areas of the carcass and, and why those are important uh, when it comes to cooking. And I've, I've done some, some polls to, at the Canadian Beef Centre of Excellence uh, when we have ranchers or, or visitors into the centre and I've often asked them, uh, okay, let's talk about different cuts or has anyone here done any of their own uh, cutting or or are they familiar with the different culinary techniques? And generally, people uh, are not super familiar. So we're going to go to some really basic, uh, the, the fundamentals, let's say. And then after that, we'll do a quick review of some of the the the, the resources that Canada Beef offers you, and also the customers, the the consumers of the product to to make their beef experience more enjoyable, more easy to enjoy and something that they can be really proud of to share with their families and their friends. So, um, here, advancing. I, I shared this slide because there's a, there's a huge commitment that goes into raising beef, uh, the process of, of, of uh, selecting uh, even the land on which it's grown, the, the, the feedstuffs, the breed that you're working with. And we have some tremendous advantages here in Canada uh, that I guess as, as personally as a Canadian beef consumer, um, uh, sometimes I feel like I take for granted. I've been in, in Europe and I've been in Asia and, and in lots of places around the world and to watch the expression on a person's face when they eat a, a, a piece of beef that I've so simply prepared for them, like just by grilling and putting some salt and that's it. And they are just blown away by the flavor. So we're really quite fortunate uh, to have such an excellent product. Looking at the entire carcass here, um, and there, you're gonna see some cues for some of the resources. And at the end of the, the presentation, there are more links, but let's just have a quick look at the carcass. 
I've got my pointer here handy. The, the carcass breaks into, into uh, seven key primals. And we're going to look a little closer at, at the different primals and, and some of the different cuts in, uh, in those areas. But here, starting up on the, on the front quarter, you have the chuck. Uh, the chuck's well known for a uh, source of ground beef. And in terms of other sort of hidden gems in the chuck, there are some tender cuts. But generally, uh, especially for like ungraded beef, uh, beef carcasses, the chuck is really known for that, that awesome flavored ground beef. There's links under each of the primals, and those link to the carcass, which is a tool you can see on the link uh, up on the top here. And so these are, are fully explored. You'll see all the different cuts that come from those uh, primals. Next in the middle, and just, just a bit, bit of particular attention here to what we refer to as the middle meats. And these are your premium, super choice, high quality uh, uh, gems within the carcass. The, the very naturally tender rib, and the loin. And within the loin, you have uh, nested in there, well protected, the tender loin. Uh, you have the stripped loin. And so these are the cuts that have a very uniform grain direction, which is important for uh, tenderness and, and the mouth feel. So that, that sort of melt in your mouth quality that everybody wants to have on a steak. Um, and also a grain direction. And we're going to look a little closer at that. Uh, as we move to the rear of the carcass, we've got the round. Uh, so you've got more lean meat there, also a good source for ground, ground beef products. Uh, or slow roast, but generally less tender. And so what you can see here, just right off the bat, looking at the top of the, the animal and in the middle, you've got the working ends. You've got the, the front end of the, ch the chuck muscles, uh, well-developed neck muscles that holds a lot of the weight of the, the front end of the carcass. Uh, and similarly with the, with the rear end, another heavy working muscle. Uh, and then in between and underneath there, the front, which is the brisket, including that foreshank, uh, the plate, which is uh, essentially beef belly or or navel, uh, and then the the flank along the side there, which is uh, which is also quite a, a strong muscle, can be quite tender. So there's the the, the general breakout of the carcass. Some of the important things to consider uh, in terms of what those those muscles are going to produce in term in an eating experience. Uh, right off the bat, I would say number one is grain direction. So I like I chose this this flank steak here. It's a flank. I would call this a roast. If you can see, and I think you can, the grain direction there, much like wood, and I've marked it with the yellow line. That's the direction of the grain. Super important to understand when we cut steaks, or if we are carving a roast, we cut against the grain, and that shortens the muscle fiber, which makes it a more tender mouthfeel. A long muscle fiber. Imagine pulling a strip off of that that flank and cooking it off and then chewing it, you're gonna have a really long chew. So it's, uh, it's almost like a, a, a way of enjoying the steak more by making sure that that muscle fiber is cut to as short as possible. We mentioned a little bit earlier about differences uh, in grass finished beef or grain finished beef. These, um, these considerations are even more important when we look at grass finished animals because they don't tend to pick up uh, that, that, uh, that richness in the marbling or that, that natural tenderness that comes from the fat within the muscle. So even more important when it comes to grass finished, grass finished products. I put a few notes here just to kind of express it quite simply. Um, the, uh, you can consider a roast. So this, this whole flank cut could be considered like a roast. It is a roast. And if we were to cut steaks, we would cut them across the grain and then you would get steaks from that roast. So a roast is like with the grain direction considered, you have steaks through it. Just like, uh, and similarly, steaks are roasts that are cut up to shorten that grain direction. Pardon me, the, the length of the muscle fiber. So I, so I put together a, a little diagram here to consider that the, the carcass itself has uh, attributes similar to wood. Grain direction in wood is similar to grain direction in, in, in meat. And so I've got pretty uh, um, creative with my, uh, my diagram here. So you've got the, the carcass, you've got a uh, leg represented by this wood in vertical grain direction, and then you've got that, that top. So almost like building a house or a table, you have that grain direction that runs up and down in the, in the rear quarter, in the front quarter, and then across. And that's where you've got that, that excellent quality in the middle meats from the rib and loin, because that grain direction is very uniform 
And so if you're imagining cutting roasts right across this carcass, you would cut them up and down across that horizontal to get those tender roasts from the rib and the short loin uh, or strip loin. Another important consideration, especially when we're looking at cuts that are less nat naturally less tender. So those working muscles in the chuck and in the, the rear quarter in the round. So here in this example, I picked out this, this, uh, this hind quarter. Uh, and so in this round, you can see pointed by these arrows, some of that connective tissue, what we call CT. CT is what holds the muscles together to the bone, to the carcass, to each other, and actually adds a lot of delicious flavor to a, pre a preparation. But you need to cook it with moist heat. It could be moist heat that was generated through the smoking process. Smoked brisket is a good example where the, the actual containment of that moisture in the smoker and then later uh, that steam element, it helps to break down that connective tissue. But you need, as you can see, the temperature to be quite high. So that's a well done temperature and well done temperature held for a long time. So think about your slow cooked pot roast or your stews or your braises. Braises is a, another word for stew, but with a big muscle cut. That slow cooking, lower temperature process to reach a, a relatively higher temperature uh, in the cut, 70 degrees Celsius, basically well done. Uh, and a long cooking period makes those connective tissues break down and become really rich and juicy. And if you think about it like an awesome stew that somebody in your house uh, or in your household or your, your grandma cooks, uh, that's where you get that awesome texture from that connective tissue, but it has to break down with a long slow cooking process and that added moisture. So an opposite to that is the dry heat method. So when we look back at the carcass and then we see that those center cuts from the middle, the tender cuts, that's where you're gonna to wanna to use a high temperature and fast cooking. Here in this picture, you can see these are uh, top sirloin medallions, relatively lean, but naturally quite tender using a high temperature, high heat, like grill, oven roasting. You can do a high heat on a rotisserie or pan sear and stir frying, all quick cooking methods that really uh, make sure that you don't overcook uh, what tends to be a, a little bit leaner a cut and doesn't need that extra long cooking time to break down the connective tissue. These uh, classic cuts, we're looking at uh, favorites like the rib roast, tenderloin steak, strip loin steaks, uh, also known as New York's, um, but there's alternatives too. And there's some cuts that come from uh, closer to the, 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 the tail end and the top sirloin. Uh, you've got from the top sirloin, you've also got the cap steak. That's one of my favorites for flavor, texture, uh, beautiful fat. Uh, sirloin flat meat, that comes from the bottom sirloin, tri-tip, and also from the, the, the front quarter, uh, the top blade flat iron steak. So those are some of the, 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 the exceptions as they move a little bit further away from that, that, that tender middle meat. And then also, I just put another point here that you can achieve tenderness through uh, mechanical tenderization. So you might have heard of the, uh, the needling method. So that actually breaks down that connective tissue inside of those cuts. You can take leaner, um, less marbled cuts and actually tenderize them with mechanical action or through marination, which brings acid like vinegar or lemon juice or, or different combinations of wine will help marinate the meat through that acid process. And that will contribute to the tenderness of the product as well. So when we talked about uh, the connective tissues, uh, we, we highlighted the need for a moist heat method, low and slow, uh, that, that cooking vessel. So uh, you, know, you pick your, your favorite pot that cooks with a nice lid on top or cover it with some tin foil. Uh, those are the cuts coming again from that, that more extreme front quarter in the chuck. And in the, one of my favorites is the, the beef shank. So that beef shank, if we imagine that, that table again, that beef shank is being cut across the grain, that grain direction going up and down, that beef shank uh, exposes some of those connective tissues in that cut and then brings that lovely, beautiful, beefy juiciness uh, that comes into a braise or a, a slow cooked stew. A, a few points that we don't have a, enough time to get into today, but I thought to mention just in case uh, when you're choosing your processor or, or working with your customer uh, to uh, achieve a, a high result and product, you've put a lot of effort into bringing this this animal to market. We have lots of resources to help your customer also have a great experience with their product in, in the kitchen. Uh, but also in, in between time, there's things to consider like aging. Aging is really important. 
natural process. It's, it's an enzymatic process that happens within the, the meat. And so natural enzymes and bacteria go to work to help develop flavor and also tenderness in beef. And nowadays, most of the aging that happens is actually uh, wet aging. So in a, in a vacuum sealed cryo back bag, uh, which is excellent. And most people are used to that, that flavor profile. But there is an appreciation for the old school dry aging. There's a picture of some dry aging happening here. And aging can actually be extended for a long period of time in the right environment, continuing to in increase flavor, uh, uh, affect texture, um, and uh, not necessarily improve juiciness, though, because through aging, you get evaporation, less water in the product. Um, dry versus wet, we covered that chilled versus frozen. This is gonna, there's some consideration here for your customers who might be able to act, to, might be able to uh, have their product or receive their product chilled versus frozen. It makes some more options for them to possibly cut their own steaks, uh, repackage them. Um, and packaging again here is important, whether it's a traditional style uh, pink butcher paper or vacuum sealed bags. Uh, all these considerations are worth uh, keeping in mind when you go to sell your animal and, and who you work with for processing. So into the, the resources that we have available, uh, number one for your customer and for yourselves, for myself, um, I recommend this to all chefs and cooks, the Roundup app. It's an awesome tool available on the iPhone or Android uh, uh, platforms. And essentially it's like having a butcher and a chef in your back pocket and a consultation for uh, the, the moment where you're going to go shop cuts in the supermarket or when you're going to dip in the freezer to figure out what you're going to cook for, for today or tomorrow or, or a couple days down the road. Uh, with the Roundup app, I think one of the best, uh, best features is that you can choose uh, a particular cut within the app or a particular cut that you actually want to cook. And if you don't, if you can't find that cut in the market or in your freezer, uh, but you have a recipe that calls for it, the Roundup app will help you by suggesting uh, alternate cuts. Because as we saw, there's essentially two cooking methods, the dry heat or the wet heat cooking method. And, and depending on the cut that you have, either of those are gonna be perfectly suited for the preparation. So I think that's one of the greatest uh, parts of this tool. And it also has like some great key points in terms of grading, in terms of uh, the quality of Canadian beef, how it's produced, the nutritional, uh, attributes. So whenever you have a chance to, to dip into the, the Roundup app and, and get some tidbits from it, it's a huge resource at your fingertips. Well, getting a little bit more technical here for, for you folks that are interested in building your own brand, building your own website, um, um, finding pictures, images, charts, anything that is a digital file, go to the Canada Beef Marketing Library. The address is there. Uh, this is a, a wealth of information at your fingertips that has been uh, beautifully cataloged, uh, accessible uh, with search features. And, and I, I tell you, I, I recommend everybody to go here to find uh, stuff that they want to build their digital profile with. Uh, on the marketing library, uh, some of the more popular uh, bits there, you've got the Canadian beef uh, merchandising guide, all different cuts, uh, Canadian veal also as well. This is where you're going to find logos, videos, all kinds of, uh, of valuable digital assets. This is quite quite new. Uh, we've, over the years of Canada Beef, uh, over probably 20 years, this has sort of uh, evolved and now uh, has, has become available uh, very accessibly online. So it's an e-learning platform. Uh, this is uh, now called Connect. The website is there listed. And that website is the entry point, the login to get into the, the programming and the online learning. Uh, currently, there are eight courses. We're actually launching a, a new COVID safety course that's been uh, essentially launched today. Uh, and and there will be more to come. Uh, from that site is, like I mentioned, the, the login point to get into the online learning portal. But it's a Canada Beef site that also has uh, interactive carcass. Uh, so it, that's if we went back to the, the second, third slide, where we have the, the carcass with those, those different sites that you can check out, all different cuts, uh, it's an awesome tool. So for yourselves and for your customers to relate back to what cuts come from where, which stakes, which rows, uh, excellent tool there. Uh, videos and text sheets, different uh, guides on how to cook, how to cut, um, and 
and then within the online learning system, uh, you've got a, a, a graduation with badges. And then I have set up a promo code for you guys. And so the uh, promo code AB4H. Uh, so that's uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make available uh, all of the courses uh, at no charge, 100% discount on that. So definitely worth checking out. And if you've got folks that are interested in uh, in using that code, uh, customers of yours, uh, go ahead and share it. Uh, the information is there essentially for the Canadian beef industry. So I've got um I broke out a few links here just to uh, um, follow up on. I've got lots more. Like Canada Beef has a ton of stuff, uh, but I think this is a good representation of some of the most uh, easily accessible and also most valuable uh, for yourselves as producers and also for the consumers who are going to enjoy the beef. And so I guess as we wrap up here, we you know we've looked at some important, uh, really really key, um, really key components when it comes to Canadian beef or any beef, but you know, speaking specifically about beef produced here in Alberta, but um, the connective, the connective tissues and the grain direction. Always keep those those in mind when you're looking at cuts uh, from the carcass. And generally, the ones that are further away from the from the middle are going to be the ones where you're going to have more connective tissue, often leaner cuts uh, that can benefit from that slow cooking process with added moisture. And all right, my, my timer one. I mean, and uh, and then the dry heat method, the cooking where uh, grain direction is is super important. Steaks and rows. Uh, learn how to cook them right. Learn how to use your barbecue. Learn how to use your temperatures right, and use the tools that we have to help uh, walk you through that with the Roundup app. Um, check out the marketing library. Uh, check out the Santa Beef recipes and our online learning center. And if anyone needs any more information or help finding more resources, I'm, I'm happy to help. I put my uh, email address on the first slide there and I'll be uh, ready to answer questions as well. So thanks so much. All right, thank you. And thank you to Canada Beef for that, that access code that I think will be greatly appreciated by our 4-H families. Um, so while folks are just gathering their thoughts and, and typing in those questions, so again, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A. Uh, feel free to type in your questions for Karen or Matthew uh, in that area. And just while they're doing that, I'd like to um, thank Alberta beef producers. They are um, a proud sponsor of 4-H Alberta and we're happy to have them. And they are the ones who connected us um, for all for this evening. So they helped um, line up Karen as well as, as the connection to Canada Beef and Matthew. So that is greatly appreciated. And thank you, Alberta Beef for that. Thanks so, for having us. Thank you. Hopefully we, we managed to learn a little something throughout the evening. Um, with that, um, Karen, where would they find some of the resources that you had pictures of within your, your presentation? Yeah, so actually all of that and a, and a few more things can be found on our website at albertabeef.org. And then just click on the consumer section and there's a drop down um, that has uh, worried about brochures on them. And that's where a lot of those graphics came from. All of the data comes from scientific papers and all sorts of fun stuff that no one likes to read, but we tried to put it into a, a more fun format. So we also have hard copies at the office, but no one's really at the <laughs> office right now. So I'm sure we could find a way to get some hard copies to you. If you want some, just, uh, yeah, let us know. Yeah, for sure. And uh, there's been a few questions about the presentation and, and some of the resources. So they will be, a, the presentation will be available on our YouTube channel. And then the resources, we will be working on a, P, a PDF or a link of some sort to make the resources easily accessible to folks as well. Definitely a lot of information has been shared. Um, Matthew, you briefly touched on the, the various options beyond your, your presentation. And maybe can you touch on the the way to receive your cuts of meat. I know when we had talked briefly before the presentation, um, you had talked about the different options and ways to get your beef. And I'm talking about the chunks of meat versus the broken up meat. Um, so if I understand correctly, uh, like the specification for uh, the process on cuts uh, and talking with the butcher and how, uh, what you want and what your preference would be. Yeah, roast correct? versus steak, that sort of concept, yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, I guess it depends a lot on the size. I would say the number one consideration here is uh, 
is a uh, freezer space. Uh, of course, I mean, if you're putting stuff to the freezer, you need a fair bit of space when you're dealing with a, you know, a quarter or a half carcass uh, or more. Um, when it comes to different package wraps, uh, frozen product, it, uh, it, it offers a little bit uh, more limited options in terms of being able to process uh, and then restore. Because of the freezing, the thawing, and then the refreezing, there's going to be a, a not so positive effect generally, especially on your more tender cuts, uh, because it actually freezing, uh, uh, it, it breaks up the muscle fibers uh, by uh, that liquid expansion freezing in the muscle meat. So, so I would recommend as much as possible getting uh, the, the, the appropriate sized package. And what, what I would say would be the, the most important consideration for that is the size of your family's table and how many people you intend to feed when you, when you cook your products. So if your customer has a relatively small family, uh, if they're a, a couple or a couple with a kid or not necessarily feeding a lot of people, that's where you're likely gonna be best, uh, best off to make a lot of cuts in a lot of small packages. And then therefore they could likely you know, thaw them out uh, in small quantities at a time. For folks who envision a, a bigger meal with more people at the table, uh, then you can work with roasts. Um, another option there is if somebody wanted to uh, plan for more roasts that they could cut themselves, they would, let's say, pull a roast out of the freezer, a large roast, they could commit, let's say, half of that uh, to a roast for one meal and could cut a couple steaks and then have those uh, not too long after. But I, but I would caution against uh, thawing and then refreezing because you spend a lot more time uh, outside of the of the proper frozen storage than a lower temperature storage or a higher temperature storage. So essentially, bigger pieces for bigger families, bigger tables, smaller pieces, smaller families, smaller tables. For sure. So through that, we've had a, a couple of the same type of question come in. So what would your uh, recommendation or preference or, or thoughts be on getting your meat either in the butcher paper or vacuum or cryovac? Yeah, great. Um, I've seen uh, really nice results of, of, of product of a beef that was stored in the butcher paper and frozen and that actually keeps really well. It's a traditional uh, favorite. But my preference would be in, in vacuum sealed plastic bags, uh, lower risk of contamination, uh, cleaner. You can pull it out of your, of your freezer, uh, properly thawed in your, in your fridge, uh, less potential for leaking. So it's, you know, it's always good to have a pan or some sort of um, you know, catch underneath the, the, whatever package you have. Uh, but, I, but I would say that would be my preference. It's gonna cost a little bit more money to process that way. But I would, if you have a choice where you can split it up, then I would go uh, take the, the vacuum sealed plastic bag for those premium cuts and then go with butcher paper for some of your uh, end meats that are a little bit less tender, some of your slow cooker roasts. Uh, ground beef will, will uh, last quite well that way too. But then again, with ground beef, it has a lower, uh, a reduced shelf life because the, the meat's been mechanically chopped. Uh, so uh, ground beef, I think, is uh, pretty much a six-month uh, maximum. Or that's the recommended maximum for storage in a freezer. You want to keep that in mind, and it will store better in vacuum sealed plastic. For sure. All right. Um, lots of questions about about the meat and the end product here. Um, so, what is the yield of live weight versus hanging weight that they pick up from a butcher? Do you have any idea on when that ballpark might be? Oof, live weight versus hang weight. That's a that's a good one. I'm not a I'm not a specialist in that. Um, I can find the answer, but live weight I think generally is around uh, fourteen hundred pounds. I'm using pounds here, and then the hanging weight tends to be somewhere between nine hundred and eleven hundred pounds in Canada. If I'm I'm not mistaken. So. Yeah, um, what is that in percentage? I'm not gonna calculate in my head. I can maybe jump in a little too here. Yeah, um, yeah There's, uh, with the yield grades, they do, they do have cutoffs, right? For the, the yield percentage. So your yield grade ones are sitting in the neighborhood of 60, 62%. Your yield grade twos are, are I think, I wanna say 56 to 59-ish or 58-ish percent. 
and then your yield grade threes are below that. So as the carcass goes through the grading process, you'll 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 have an idea of of what the the retail yield will be. So it's going to depend a little bit on how fat the steer is. Um, but if you're looking at you know a ballpark figure, you know go 59, 60 percent, and and that should get you in the neighborhood. For sure, and Canada Beef Grading Agency has a lot of that information readily available on their website. Um, Karen, the next question is for you. Actually, I just saw you went to mute. Um, wow. Yeah, um, the term biodiversity. Can you explain that to maybe some of our younger members who might not know what that means? Sure. So when we're when we're talking about biodiversity, what we're really talking about is the number and different kinds of animals, birds, bugs, even plants that exist in a landscape. So the more of, of different types of animals that you have in a, on a landscape, the more diverse it is and, and the more valuable it is. Because if you think about things like birds, they like to nest at different lengths, right? So if you have a pasture where you've got different types of forage as well, like different, you've got some bushes and you've got some different heights of grass, different birds are going to live in the different layers. And so it's, there's a concern around the world about the number of species and the types of species decreasing, right? So you may have heard, you know, like 45% of all, this is a made up number, 45% of all frogs have disappeared, right? So what we wanna do is try and preserve the, the number of different species of animals and plants and birds that can live on a, on a landscape and keep it healthy. Nope, for sure, thank you. Yeah, and then I think, yeah, cattle have a bad rep, if you will, when it comes to bio, um, greenhouse gases, but they definitely are very important for the environment and biodiversity, absolutely. All right, with that, we're closing in on an hour and our goal is to keep it right at an hour. So um, I will ask for any last comments. So we'll go with Karen and then Matthew. So any, any final comments for everybody out there? I would just, just keep in mind when you're talking to consumers, if, if they come at, and they probably won't because they're looking to buy beef from you, but if, if they do come at you a little bit confrontational about some of those topics, about hormones, about antibiotics or environment or even COVID, um, it's really important not to be defensive and confrontational back to them. So it's really important to try and be understanding and try and put yourself in their shoes and pretend like you have no knowledge and try to really get in their heads a bit so that you can talk to them really calmly and, and not be like, well, you don't know anything. Why would I even want to sell beef to you now? Right. That's, that's not the way to win someone over. So I would just say, just really, no matter what they say, just kind of keep your cool and, and don't be confrontational back. If, if you do get some pressure about some of these, these production practices and just try and help them understand why we do what we do and that we care about what we do. And we have a lot of pride in what we do. Oh, for sure. Thank you, Karen and Matthew. Yeah, that's great, Karen. Um, I would I totally agree. And I guess when it comes to, uh, you know, sales and marketing, uh, people are, are shopping for products. They, they want to buy something that they uh, will be confident in and they want to buy it from somebody who is confident in selling it. And so it's important to understand your product well, understand all its positive attributes, um, be really good at speaking about that. Uh, in, in that conversation, you're likely to win a customer by telling them about how amazing your beef is and, and how you raised it. I, I meant to mention a point in this time when people are so concerned about where their food comes from, uh, who grows their product, who grows the food, who's processing it, who's handling it, where do they get it from? And they want to share that story with their family and with their friends. You have an amazing advantage and, and, and such a, a premium quality product in that regard that that you can that they can trace it right back uh, to the farm. So so be confident in that that there are buyers looking for this product, um, and there is huge demand for it all around the world. And it is something tremendously uh, exceptional in terms of, of high quality protein. Thank you, 